Thanks, Steve. So today I wanted to kind of give you all some advice that I wish someone had given me you know, like 10 or 15 years ago when I started developing open source software. But I think even if you don't develop open source software, many of the same messages hopefully apply as well. So I'm going to start just talking very briefly about kind of my background, where I'm coming from, kind of maybe why you should listen to me, and then follow that up with a slide why you shouldn't listen to me, and then dive into the, uh, dive into the advice. So, um, <laughs> possibly the thing I'm most famous for is ggplot2, which implements the, the grammar of uh, graphics, which will chase, uh, turn into the glamour of, of graphics. But what my day job is, is to make open source tools that really empower data scientists, primarily data scientists who use R. So I also uh, manage a team of open source developers at our studio, and as I'll talk a little bit later, I also write a bunch of books about R. So why shouldn't you listen to me? Why, why might this advice not apply to you? I wanted to start with kind of a few uh, threats to the external validity of this talk. And the first one is that I come from very much a, a place of privilege, of, of mostly unearned privilege being a white guy. Uh, and I th I've tried to be aware of that. I think one piece of advice that I used to give, which is great for me, but not so much for everyone, is that to make mistakes in public. And I think this is really a place where I benefit from my privilege, because if you're a white dude and you make a mistake in public, people are like, wow, he is so brave. <laughs> Whereas if you're a woman or a person of color or another minority and you make a mistake in public, people are like, what an idiot. Um, so I've, I try to be aware of this. There's certainly things I'm not aware of, but I've tried to do my best to give advice that's applicable to everyone. I think another big threat to the validity is that I am now paid full-time to work on open source development. This is now my job. This is something I can like turn off the computer at the end of the night and I don't have to think at the end of the day and I don't have to think about it. And I think that, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but I think that also has had a tremendous impact on my ability to kind of steadily do this work like year after year. I think also the R community is a little bit different to other programming language communities, primarily because R is a programming language that is used primarily by non-programmers. And I think that makes, the, that makes the community a little bit different, and I think a little bit like more awesome, in my admittedly biased opinion. It's certainly much more diverse than most other programming language communities, both in terms of the, like, what the people look like and in terms of what they do with R. And then finally, kind of as a statistician, I feel obliged that I have to warn you that this is a study of n equals one. Um, this is strictly my opinion. So with, with that done, uh, my first piece of advice is, is pretty trite. Like it really is a marathon and not a sprint. That if you want to have an impact on the world, I think you need to be prepared to work on problems for years at a time, potentially. And so I have kind of four bits of advice around that, uh, or four sort of loosely organized thoughts around that. So first of all, like money is actually important, right? I don't think you should be, I strongly believe you shouldn't be optimizing your life to maximize your income, but having enough money so that you don't need to worry about making ends meet is a tremendous reliever of stress. Now, I, I can't really offer much advice here because I think my career has just been tremendously lucky that I found a company um, that's just so closely aligned with my goals that I don't think my advice, um, my experience generalizes at all. But I really, a few years ago, I really enjoyed this book by Cal Newport called So Good They Can't, Annoy you, uh, Can't Ignore You about building up career capital that you can then kind of trade in to get the types of things you want out of a job or out of a career. Then I think if you're thinking about the, the long haul, you've got to think about like your mind and body as well. I think it's really important to have some kind of regular like physical activity. Uh, I do yoga. I love doing yoga. Um, you know, I don't think it matters what you do, do, except that if you're thinking about having an impact in like even an open source coding, you have to think like, how am I going to make sure my just my body holds up for 10 years of um, typing and hunched over a computer. I also think it's valuable to think about kind of the mind. One of the things that um, I found helpful is learning a little bit about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, particularly through this 
book called Feeling Good, just having some understanding of like how emotions work and how you can kind of work with your own emotions, I think, is, is really, really valuable. Uh, I'll come back to this a little bit later in the, um, to talk about criticism, because I think that's a really, that's probably the place where I use these ideas the most. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of like ritual and habit and how do you like sort of free yourself from not having to be like rah, 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 excited about everything you're doing. So again, you can kind of maintain this pace. So I have like a few quotes um, which I've found kind of effective. I think the first thing is that most people's mental model of motivation is wrong. You think that you start with motivation and then you do work. But that I think is actually completely the wrong way around. The way you get motivated is by doing something. And so if you just sit around waiting to get motivated, You'll, you'll never get motivated, or it's very, very hard to get motivated. And kind of relatedly, like, if you're procrastinating a bunch, it's not actually a time management problem, it's an emotion management problem. Uh, and so I think this is where the sort of learning about emotions, learning about cognitive behavioral therapy is really helpful for me. Uh, if, if you don't want to go that far, one really neat technique for dealing with procrastination is this uh, structured procrastination where basically, um, you know, when you're procrastinating, you normally end up doing something, right? You scrupulously clean the house or you, you know, whatever. The idea of structured procrastination is when there's something like really important you need to do that you've been procrastinating, find something worse and make that the thing that you should be doing, and then you'll do the other thing. <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty effective technique. And for me, like sort of one of the ways that this, I think one of the things that's been really important for me is just building up like habits so you don't have to think, you don't have to be mo motivated. Like I'm not motivated to go to yoga every day. An alarm goes off on my calendar and I just go. Like I don't, I don't even think about it. And one of the things that I think has been really effective for me as well is I have a, a really regular writing habit. So I write for an hour or so every day in the morning, and I don't have to think about that. That's now a habit I just do. And that's basically allowed me to write a book a year for the last five years. Now, I've given this advice about writing books to a lot of people that all you have, to, like writing a book is really, really simple. All you have to do is write for a day, write for an hour every day. And after a couple of years, you'll have a book. But this is like, this is sort of the worst sort of advice because it's really simple, but it's, it's not at all easy. It's really hard to do this. Uh, and no one, has, no one to my knowledge has successfully followed my advice for writing a book. But this is, this is what's worked for me. Um, but, I, and, but the idea of that this is just a habit, I don't get, I'm not motivated, I'm not excited necessarily about writing these books, but I have this habit, so I just do it day after day after day. And if you keep doing that, after a while you end up with something significant. And a few years ago, I really enjoyed reading this article in a list apart about habit fields and kind of building these sort of like places in your life where it just, you sort of train yourself to associate a physical space with like a mental activity. And so when you get into that space, that mental activity just kind of happens. Again, like you, you don't have to be motivated, you just kind of like do it out of force of habit. And I think this idea of sort of thinking like little like rituals and habits are, are really, really important so that you don't have to maintain that really high level of motivation in the long term because that's basically impossible. I think it's also really important to be very deliberate, very careful in your social use of social media. So personally, I use Twitter a bunch. It can be tremendously energizing, like interacting with people who have like benefited from my work is something that keeps me motivated. It's really useful for kind of quickly polling the community. What are problems? Like, do you experience the same thing? What should I call that? Uh, and to kind of you know, learn about problems and to keep up to date. But... At the same time, it's a really rich source of distractions and FOMO. I am convinced, like, the KPI of the Twitter UX is outrage. Um, <laughs> but this is what Twitter is optimizing for. They want you to, like, read your, the tweets you see and get, Argh! and so you have to hammer, hammer out a response. So you have to, like, do everything you can to avoid that. I think do not use, like, Twitter's, Twitter's clients are terrible. They're not optimized for what you actually want to optimize for. Uh, and then, as I'll talk about shortly, Twitter's also a great place to get insulted. <laughs> so I, I think Twitter, like, on, a, on, on the whole, Twitter is, like, really important to me. I think kind of the, 
the, the key thing is that you do not have a moral duty to listen to everyone. Like you should keep, you know, keep your, your eyes and ears open for criticism, but you do not need to relentlessly expose yourself to people who do not like what you are doing. And you should like mute early and incredibly often. Like if you're not muting, I don't know, I mute a lot of people. I'm muting like multiple people a, a day. Um, <laughs> and then my last piece of advice is like, for everything, like turn off notifications. Like I, again, this is I'm in a you know a career position where basically no one ever needs to get in touch with me urgently, so I can do this ruthlessly. I use Batch inbox, so I only get emails delivered twice a day. I know not everyone is in that position, but everything you can do to reduce the number of interruptions you get during the day, anything you can do to increase the amount of time you spend, like deeply focused on like the hard problems. Is, is really, really valuable. So turn off as many notifications as you can possibly stand to. And, and so that kind of leads me to my next point, which is I think particularly if you're an open source developer or like doing anything in public really, I think one way you know that you're succeeding is people are gonna like criticize you. And so I'm gonna show you like three kind of recent criticisms of my work that have like really gotten under my skin and then talk a little bit about how I try and cope with them. So the first one is a, a lot of, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about marketing later, but um, this criticism is, is basically nothing like what I've worked on, the tidyverse, isn't, it hasn't become popular because of quality, but because my company has spent a bunch of money promoting it. Um, this is annoying because it's both untrue, like my company has not spent a bunch of money promoting it, and I think, well, this, so this is just something I'm like, Argh! and another one, oh, it's just like a, it's just a marketing term. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll come back to that later, but please don't. Um, and this, this is one of my favorites because um, they use this neologism, the toadyverse, instead of the, the tidyverse. Um, so... I think the first thing to remember or to, to know is that dealing with criticism is a skill and you can get better at it. Uh, I think I've, I've been like forced to get better at it. I hope you don't have to have experienced the same thing, but this is definitely something you can get better at. I think my biggest piece of advice is you need to find a community of people who is like totally supportive of you, like you know, friends basically, and vent to them in private. There's basically no, um, it's just not worthwhile to vent in public because it just gets people like more engaged in the whole thing. You're optimizing, you're increasing the amount of outrage on Twitter. Uh, so I think you should vent in private, like get those emotions out to like people you trust and then respond as gracefully as possible in public. And maybe that's, you know, maybe the most graceful thing you can do is do nothing and that's fine too. And maybe you just have to mute that person and move on with your life. But I think generally, like, there's also, like, there's, there's, like, not only what you should do, which is, again, like, easy to say, but, like, how, how, do, you, how do you handle, like, your own feelings? Like, how do you get to sleep at night when you're, like, so wound up with unrelenting rage that these people have said such horrible things about the work that you've poured your life into. And to me, I think that some of the sort of techniques of CBT, like kind of like the thoughtfully questioning, well, like, what if this, what, like, what if it is true? Like, what's the worst that can happen? Uh, and I think, I, I don't know, I really feel like a lot of open source maintainers could really benefit from like a good relationship with a therapist to like kind of like deal with these issues like yourself and not like impose them on the on the community. Another really great talk kind of related to this is by um, Evan Saplici, which I believe is the Hungarian pronunciation and I apologize if he actually pronounces it the American way, which who knows what that is? But fantastic talk. He's the creator of the Elm language. Talks about the hard part of open, the hard hard parts of open source, which that and the hard parts are all the stuff around people. Like the technology is easy, people are hard. I think the other thing it's very easy to kind of get into this trap of is like 
following the numbers. Like, you are not your Twitter followers. You are not the number of GitHub stars you have. And I think particularly amongst technical folk, it's easy to kind of narrow in on these, like, numbers and focus optimizing those numbers because optimizing a number is like an easy thing to do. But I think Godhart's law is very applicable here. It's like as soon as you start, optim as soon as you take a metric, a good metric, and try to optimize for that metric, it instantly becomes a bad metric. You end up optimizing something that you're not actually interested in. And so I really, I, I really like this um, paragraph from Letters to a Young Poet, which is kind of the inspiration for this, the talk title. Um, so this uh, Rainer Maria Rilke wrote these letters. Uh, some kind of young poet wrote to him asking for advice in the early 1900s, and, and this is what he wrote back. There's something like, s somehow you have to know in your heart that what you're working on is good is good and you should tr try as much as possible to avoid relying on external signals to validate yourself. And I think this just to me applies so beautifully to open source code as well. Like, like a piece of art is good if it's born of necessity, right? A piece of software is good if it's born because you need it and then want to share it with the world. Like it doesn't matter if other people don't like it. Like, Whatever. If it makes you happy, that's really valuable. Now, at the same time, I think there's a sort of tension between like getting the right amount of external data. Like you don't want to just be hovering like shut in a tiny little like an ivory tower or, or, a, or a cave where you're just pursuing your vision of genius uh, without any recourse to input from the outside world. That's, I think you can end up in very, a very bad place following that path as well. But you don't want to be completely reliant on what other people are telling you as well. Uh, particularly in my own work, I think one of, the thing, one of the things that I struggle with is I think part of my job is to like, find the problems that no one has a name for and like, name them so that you can then talk about them and think about them. And this means, like, it's very hard to ask people what they need because, like, they don't know. They don't have a name for it. So you can't rely 100% on external data. This is sort of the same reason, like, focus groups often fail. People can't articulate actually what the problem is. But at the same time, you don't just want to relentlessly follow your own vision because you know, it's very easy to create something that works for you, that makes you like the smartest, most genius programmer that ever existed, but doesn't help anyone else. And then finally, like, marketing is like a sort of a bad name in like academia and in software development. But, like, if you build the most amazing piece of software and don't tell anyone about it, no one is going to use it. Like, this just seems, like, so, so obvious to me. Like, your, your work, the impact of your work is a product of the quality of your work and how many people use it. And I don't think, ma marketing is not about, like, putting lipstick on a pig. It's not about taking subpar work and tricking people into using it. I think marketing is also about like, putting, your, putting yourself in the mind of a newcomer and saying, like, how can I explain my work to you in a way that you can understand and then benefit from? And so, like, you know, I think at least for whatever you produce, you should be able to kind of answer the, the, the following questions. These are kind of aimed at software, but, um, you know, what does it do? The number of, you know, I'll often read, like, Hacker, I read Hacker News a bunch, probably like many of you, and often I'll read, read some cool, like, new software thing. I'll go to the page, and I'll read it, and I have absolutely no clue what the, what the point of this thing is. Like, what language is it written in? Like, what, am I, what problem is it trying to solve? Uh, so I think thinking like when someone hits your website or you read me, how can you answer these questions about like what it does and why should someone care about it is really important. I think it's also useful to provide some kind of symbols of trust uh, for open source software these days. I think these are like, you know, build badges, Travis badges, code coverage badges, giving some kind of indicators that the person cares about the craft of software development, software engineering, not just uh, producing a pretty website, and then making it uh, as easy as possible to get it, like get it from the internet onto your computer. I think the metric of 
kind of time from reading about something cool and actually using it on your computer is a really valuable metric to optimize. Because the, if you can make that as short as possible, people can see, you see your work and try it out and, and see if it's for them very, very quickly. And then some hints, I think, really, if you're writing code, like show a few code snippets so people can get just a feel for the interface without having to read a ton of documentation. And then I think really valuable to also like position your work relative to other projects. Doing this as kind of genuinely and honestly as you can. If you can't kind of, if you can't concisely enumerate the, the key benefits of your competitors, like, I, I think that's a, a, bad, a bad place to be in. Like, you should be able to sell people on your competitor. You should be able to tell precisely why people shouldn't, be able, shouldn't want to use your product or use something else, and that, because that will help you understand what problem you're trying to solve. If you'd like to learn more about marketing, uh, I found, like, Seth Godin really helpful. A lot of this stuff I read... Uh, I don't know, in kind of the early to mid-2000s, so all of my references are a little bit dated now. Um, but I think all of this, you know, all of this stuff is, these, these, these big ideas don't change much over time. So to kind of sum up, um, the, 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 the things that I kind of think about like every day while trying to have an impact on the world through open source software for data science, like this idea that it's a marathon, that if you want to have an impact on the world, you have to be prepared to put in potentially years of work. And thinking about that, like how do you, how do you maintain your physical body? How do you handle your mind and your emotions? And then working out like what are habits you can create in your everyday life in order to, so that you don't have to stay like rah, rah, rah motivated the whole time. I think equally the other thing is like figuring out how to break bad habits you have. Uh, one of my bad habits, which I kind of regularly get into, is like waking up and reading Twitter, um, which I think has to be like, it's probably the, the worst way to wake up. <laughs> but it is so like freaking addictive. So I have to, like, I have all these little tricks, like I delete Twitter off my phone for a while, and then I start using it on my computer, like, and then I delete it off my computer, and I switch back to my phone, like, moving different places on my phone. But I think these, these, even these little tricks, just, like, moving the icon around on the phone, so you can't just kind of, like, automatically go there, with, your, like, your lizard brain just clicks there the first thing you wake up. You've got some chance for your, like waking mind to say, hey, this is actually not that good for me. It gives me this great short-term payoff, but it's bad for me in the long term. Uh, which ties into my next point. Really be deliberate in your use of social media. Like, you have no moral obligation to listen to everyone. Like, learn how to, whatever social media platform you use, learn how to mute people and do it early and often. If someone is just, like, causing your blood pressure to rise, even if they have a good point, I think thinking about, like, you know, you've got to put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Like, make sure you're in this for the long run, like, mute them if they're not being useful. Criticism, like, particularly if you're a prominent open source developer, but I think if you're doing, having, if you're having an impact on the world, like, one of the ways you find out about it is people start criticizing you. Um, and so I think, like, one of the things that I've kind of, the sort of mental jujitsu I've done over the years is to, like, think about my successes, like ggplot2 was really, success, was really successful when someone used it to commit a really egregious case of academic fraud. Like by turning it around in your head, like you know you're successful when people attack your entire body of work uh, and create neologisms to like, to describe it in, in, in insulting ways. Like that's how you can know you're, you're having an impact on the world. I think really, really be careful about numbers. Um, don't spend your life optimizing numbers. Like, it, it's really, it, there's, this, there's always this challenge. Like, as soon as you can, I think as soon as you can quantitate, like, precisely quantitize something so that you can then optimize it, you've almost already, like, ruined what you, you can't get the outcome that you want. I think it's important to pay attention to these numbers and to think about them, but really think holistically, like, what sort of impact do you want to have? How can you measure that with, like, multiple metrics, not all of them being quantitative? 
And then finally, if you want people to, to use your work, you have to sell it. You've got to learn, like learn a little bit about marketing. You don't need to be the world's best marketer, but if you can think about how your work is seen from the fir for the first time by an outsider, it's much, much easier for people to pick it up and start using it. Thank you.